My name is Rebecca Jaros, and I'm a fitness and sports instructor at Garrison Petawawa. Today, I'm going to be discussing training for ruck marching um, or low bearing marches. The main things I'll touch on today is the proper training program to optimize your rucking performance, to help increase your speed while avoiding injury, and decrease your energy expenditure. I will quickly touch on a small study that was performed and then I'll end off discussing some of the common injuries we see due to ruck march training as well. Um, if you are in the military, you've probably done a fair share of rucking. Your unit has probably had you randomly ruck mm, 15 kilometers or more with no workup training. <laughs> um, and you've probably done um, no strength training to complement the rucking as well. I'm sure you've all seen a coworker get injured on a ruck or due to a ruck, and I'm sure you've all seen that person rucking bent over uh, with their torso pretty much parallel to the floor. Uh, so hopefully some of the topics I touch on today can help prevent all of these things from happening uh, in the future or at least decrease the chance of it happening. So what is ruck marching? So ruck marching can be described as transporting gear from one location to another while wearing a backpack um, or a ruck. So the training process uh, implemented to build a soldier's capacity to ruck is typically done by increasing both intensity and volume with no formal workup training during regular physical training hours. So this meaning uh, a lot of the time you guys don't get scheduled the proper amount of time to properly safely work up uh, to your end goal and you just get thrown into random rucks whenever they can fit them in and they give you basically the max distance without any work up training to get to that distance. And this poses many issues, uh, one of which being that there are more emphasis on cardiovascular performance than your load carrying capabilities. Um, so, like I said before, I'm located here uh, in Petawawa, and we run the Iron Warrior event, or it's previously been known as the Iron Man event. Um, if you don't know what this event is, um, it's a pretty gruesome event. It involves a long ruck, I believe it's roughly 32 kilometers at the start, and then that's followed by a roughly four kilometer portage with the canoes on their backs. And then there's a eight kilometer canoe, and then you finish off with another six kilometers of rucking. So it is a full day event. Uh, and obviously, if you're going to do this event, you should be putting in the proper amount of training. A lot of people don't get to, especially because a lot of the time, you know, you get events like Wainwright that happen right before you would start your training season um, and when you're there you can't get the same kind of training you would if you were at um, home and you had access to the gym all the time so a lot of people just jump in and do the iron warrior without any of the workout training that they should be doing and that's when you see a lot of the injuries happening um, so before the event usually about five months prior um, us PSP staff we try and reach out to our units to find out what kind of training they're gonna be following to build up to the event. And unfortunately, the majority of the training is just long marches um, with improper progressions of weight and improper progressions of distance with the occasional canoe training worked in. And I'm not seeing all units that are like this. There are some that do have some pretty great programs or they have taken the time to reach out to their PSP staff and get the best training that they can. But majority of the time, it's the improper training, and we see a lot of the members getting injured before the event even happens, and then they can't compete in, in the event at all. So hopefully some of this information today can help prevent that for members in the future. So how to train for ruck marches. So when regular ruck marching with loads, so regular meaning at least twice a month, is included in your training program, it also includes running, um, resistance training. Members march faster than if march training was not included. So it still is important to include those long distance marches into your training program um, a couple times a month. In a recent study done, it was found that with a 12 week physical training program, 
involving a combination of both cardiovascular training and resistance training. It improved the speed at which men completed a 3.2 kilometer distance carrying a 46 kg bag. Uh, the soldier can progressively overload in many ways, uh, including but not limited to moving faster. So you can go for speed uh, if you wanted to push yourself a little bit more, um, adding more weight. So you can fluctuate with the weight of your ruck. You could do a shorter distance with more weight. Um, you could do a longer distance with lighter weight. Um, and then also changing the grade of the incline. So I doubt you're rucking on a treadmill. Um, but trying to choose a course where you know there's going to be some hills. Um, so not only uphill, but downhill is something that you can definitely train for. And it's going to change um, how, how the training goes for you. So performing longer, lighter ruck marches can be implemented in a training plan as a recovery tool that, allows, uh, that also follows the principle of specificity. So you're still getting um, that same style of training in. So it's almost like a deload. So if you have a deload, you should have deload training um, in your training plan. So maybe on your deload week, you you go to a lighter ruck. Um, maybe it's a little faster, but it's shorter, um, but just so it's less stress on your body. Um, after including heavier ruck marches into the organized physical training schedule, individual soldiers may find moving under lighter loads for longer distances is physically less demanding. And that's just because you've built yourself up to carrying heavier loads. So having a lighter rock, it's gonna feel a lot easier for you. Walking with backpack loads over several weeks can result in a decrease in the energy cost carrying the load. So it doesn't um, take as much energy from your body to carry those loads now, because you've progressed properly to that. And then obviously it's with anything, you know, you, that's what training does is to make it feel easier nothing gets easier um, it just feels easier because you've you've built yourself up to that so training considerations so in situations where a soldier needs to carry a specific weight so for example iron warrior i know they have a set weight i'm trying to remember i think it's 75 pounds i could be wrong it could be 40. Um, the soldier might consider training with a lighter load than what is needed but train at a faster pace. Um, alternatively though, for a tactical training event or de deployment or pre-deployment, a soldier could consider adding more weight to get used to carrying all mission essential equipment and PPE carried while conducting patrols. So if you know there's gonna be extra equipment that you're gonna be carrying, um, like guns, you know, maybe you have things strapped to your legs, um, I don't know what all is involved in that, um, but if you know you're going to be carrying extra weight, you should train for that because it is going to be a lot higher of energy expenditure and um, you want to be conditioned for that before you, you go off for sure. Uh, research suggests that load carriage training should focus less on distance and frequency and more on higher intensity. However, higher intensity must be balanced with proper gradual progression and rest periods in combination with other forms of physical training. Okay, so like I said before, when we look at training programs for Iron Warrior, a lot of the times it's like multiple times a week. They have them going out for these crazy long rucks. Um, and you get more out of doing, you know, maybe one high intensity ruck um, you know, every two weeks, okay, I be so, and f you want to still include the strength training, which I'm going to get to in a second here. It's not just cardio that needs to be built up for this. Um, you need to be hitting all kinds of, um, like strength training, conditioning. You want to make sure that you're getting your recovery in properly. Your training progression is proper. You're getting deload weeks in, so you're not overtraining. Um, so there's a lot that has to get put into the, the training for a ruck, and a lot of people just think it's a simple, um, just go out and ruck 20k, but there's so much more that goes into it than that. So strength training emphasis. So unfortunately, like I said, most military currently rely on load carriage training as the predominant method of exercise for ruck marches. The principle of specificity should be followed in order to develop low carriage capacity. 
but it is important to note that aerobic fitness, fat-free mass, and leg and back strength are important physiological factors associated with load carriage and performance and changes in carriage performance. So yes, the principle of specificity, I can never say that right, should be followed. You know, you should be training exactly what you need to be training for. But, you know, if you've got a lot of extra um, fat on you, that's going to be a lot harder. Okay? If your leg and back don't have the strength to complete the distances that you're trying to do, that's when the injuries are going to happen. Your core isn't going to be able to stabilize your spine. You're going to get a back injury or maybe, you know, your legs aren't strong enough and your knees are going to give out. Uh, so there's a lot of things you need to, to strengthen your body to be able to handle this kind of load for this kind of distance. Um, often, unit physical training focuses on aerobic conditioning which could potentially increase the risk of overuse injuries. So on top of the long rucks that get thrown in multiple times a week or once a week, you get them throwing you, you know, go for a 10K run this day, you know, and you're doing runs two, three times a day or a week, sorry, hopefully not a day, um, a week. And then you've got the, the ruck in there as well. So that's a lot of kilometers and distance uh, and impact that you're putting on your body. Uh, so it can increase the risk of overuse injuries. There is potential to reduce the risk of overuse injuries and improve ruck capacity by including strength training into the training program. Research suggests that a balanced training schedule should include some load carriage training as well as non-marching training focused on enhancing muscular strength and endurance. If resistance training is included in a training program, and emphasizes strength development of the trunk and lower musculature, it may be possible to reduce the risk of overuse injuries with the combination of resistance training and specific loaded marches. Muscle economy could potentially be increased and allow each soldier to use less energy per given task. So this way you're still strengthening your body, um, getting it ready for this rock, but without all that high impact I mean, it's a lot of impact on your knees to be rucking. Um, if you're shuffling, you know, it's not as horrible on your knees, but um, this way you're getting your body conditioned for it without having that crazy amount of impact um, on the body, especially with that weight on your back like that. Um, so however, it should, be, it should not be ignored that strength training alone can improve the capacity to ruck even when the load carriage itself is not integrated in the PT schedule. So even if, let's say you're one of those people that decides um, you're gonna go out and do the Iron Warrior this year, but you didn't train for it, but you just didn't train by not, you know, you didn't do any rucks leading up to it. You know, you maybe you did the random one with your unit occasionally, but you didn't progress properly up into that rucking. But you do go to the gym quite often. You know, you work out your your trunk, your, your lower body, um, you would do better with that ruck because you had strength training worked into it than if you had none at all. So you can still improve your, your ruck time, your performance with strength training alone. However, I don't suggest that. I do suggest that you get um, your rucking in as well. So load carriage exerts large forces on the lumbar spine, as well as the hips, shoulders, and knees. So a program that focuses on squats and deadlifts, shoulder presses, and farmer walks may help to develop more stabilized trunk musculature, which could help protect the spine, the hips, and replicate a similar protection to the neck and traps during ruck marching. Okay, that bag on your back, especially if you don't have one that fits you properly, it puts a lot of wear on your body. Uh, so it's really important that you have, you know, strong core and everything like that to protect your lumbar spine. So I'm now going to just quickly talk about a five week mini study that compared programming methodologies to increase rucking speed. So the members of the study were broken into three groups. Uh, all groups performed a strength assessment at the start. Um, they did a six mile ruck for time at 45 pounds. 
and a six mile run assessment all during week one. So they all did the same at the start of the mini study and they repeated these assessments on week five of the study. So they all did the same thing. Um, so each group performed different programming between the weeks one and five assessment weeks. So group A, uh, they're the strength emphasis um, group. So they were training three days per week for strength and two days per week for endurance. Group B was a hybrid group, so they did two strength training days per week, and they did three endurance days per week. And then group C, and this is like 90% of those that are training for Iron Warrior, um, group C had an endurance emphasis, so they were training strength one day per week, and they were doing endurance four days per week. So there were only a total of 17 people completing this uh, program. Uh, at the study's conclusion, the strength emphasis group, so group A, and the hybrid group, so group B, programming, significantly outperformed the endurance emphasis programming group, so group C. They improved rucking speed performance on a six-mile ruck assessment wearing a 45-pound backpack. So overall, the strength group improved its ruck speed by 8.5%, the hybrid group improved by 9.4%, while the endurance group improved by just 3.2%. So I know there weren't many people in this study, um, but given how drastic the results were, the, the difference in that improvement, um, I think it's clear to say that uh, including strength is extremely important when training for uh, a load-bearing march. So if there is one main point I'm trying to get across um, from this workshop, it is that strength training is just as, if not important, more important than the endurance training when trying to improve that rack performance. Strength training uh, is important for helping maintain posture while rucking, as well as helping to prevent injuries. The forward trunk lean that a person has when carrying the load increases with increased weight, obviously. So with a load of approximately 40% body weight, uh, your lean increases by 11%. So this puts a lot more strain on the low back, causing injuries. Uh, core exercises are also important to include in your strength training as the core helps to assist with stabilizing of back musculature and structures during the load carry. So now I'm going to go into some of the common overuse injuries that we see um, with rucking. Some don't seem um, like a big deal, but they can cause other injuries uh, that are worse. So uh, the first one I have are blisters. So blisters are very common. Uh, they're caused by friction. I'm sure all of you have had a blister before and they may not seem like a big deal but they can change your gait when you're rucking, which in turn will cause more significant injuries. So this can include issues with your ankles, your knees, your hips, soft tissue injuries. Heavy loads increase the incidence of blisters. Um, so, you know, if you've got a big blister on your foot, a lot of the time when you're walking, you're trying to avoid, you know, pressing that part of your foot against the shoe or down on the floor. So you, you might be walking with your toe lifted a little or, you know, you're trying to avoid making it worse. And that's causing you to walk differently. You know, maybe your step is shorter. Maybe you're landing on the outside of your foot uh, and you're putting more pressure there. So that can cause more injuries in itself. Just by the way, you're changing how you walk. Um, you want to make sure that you keep your feet dry, so using synthetic socks instead of cotton. Uh, you could also use sock liners. It's also important that you have proper fitting boots. If your feet don't or your boots don't fit your feet properly, that's going to cause the blisters because it's going to cause some friction. Uh, if you plan on buying a new pair of boots, uh, it is suggested that you go later in the day uh, as your feet tend to swell more you know, later in the day than compared to first thing in the morning. So if you go in the morning, you might find a pair of boots that fits perfect. And then you go to put them on at the end of the day and they feel really tight because your feet have swollen uh, throughout the day with all the blood flowing. Uh, so they do suggest going at the end of the day uh, when your feet are kind of at their most swollen part 
uh, and then that way you you know that the boots are going to fit properly um, yeah <laughs> when choosing a pair of boots you also want to try and keep them as light as possible so every kilogram that's added to the foot increases the energy expenditure by seven to ten percent uh, so it does get quite exhausting when your feet get heavy if you've ever rocked in the rain when your feet are soaked i'm sure you've noticed the difference from when they're dry um, how much heavier your feet feel and the energy it takes to try and move them like you were before they were wet uh, you can also tape the skin or use skin coverings like moleskin or second skin to help protect a blister. Uh, and then you want to be sure to treat any kind of infection. So if you notice that the blister is starting to get infected, uh, you want to make sure you're cleaning it properly. Maybe get it checked if you think it's getting worse. Um, keep it clean. Uh, so another small kind of problem uh, is chafing. Um, especially, you know, if your ruck isn't fitted properly, uh, if it's raining or it's really hot and you're sweating, uh, it's recommended to use a product like Body Glide uh, that can help protect the skin uh, from the chafing. Um, make sure that your ruck is fitted good. Because if it's not fitted, then it's going to be rubbing on the shoulders and the armpits, uh, your hips. So stress fractures is another very common injury and they are caused by repetitive overload so just that constant striking on the ground especially when you're in ruck um, like rucking boots um, I don't know why I can't think of the right word for that right now but um, if you're not shuffling you're heel striking and you know when you're out running hopefully you're not heel striking and you're you're landing on your forefoot uh, but when you're in your boots, your heel striking, so all of that impact is going right into the shin, right into the knees, and then you have all that extra weight on you as well. So it's not even like it's just body weight, um, but you have that extra weight causing that extra stress as well. Uh, so females are at a higher risk of developing stress fractures. Uh, other factors that increase risk of stress fractures are tobacco use. Um, height so taller people tend to get stress fractures more often and as well as physical inactivity so if you're someone who you know isn't quite that active they sit on their couch uh, quite a bit and then you randomly go for a ruck because that's what's scheduled for PT that day you're more likely to you know get a stress fracture than uh, compared to someone who's been um, you know rucking properly with safe progressions. Uh, stress fractures can also be caused by poor nutrition, especially in the female population due to the majority of females having low calcium, uh, so some weaker bones causing the stress fractures. Pelvic stress fractures are more common in females due to overstriding to keep pace. So since they typically have shorter legs, they are taking longer strides than they should be to try and keep up causing the stress on the pelvis. So stride length and frequency is different for everyone. So trying to keep up with others can lead to overstriding. Um, so try not to worry about others, just worry about yourself and go at your own pace. I know that's hard to say because I know if you're, you're going out with your unit in a group or it's an event like Rucking Bear where you, you, know, you get the whole brigade rucking together and, and you have to keep up because you're taking over the front of the line. Um, I know it's hard. Hopefully, um, maybe bring your chain of command, direct them to this podcast, um, and hear it from you know PSP. But they can't expect you know maybe this female is five two and she's walking with a bunch of men that are you know six foot. You know your leg length is very different, right? And if you're going at the same pace, uh, you know. If your pace is the same, but your stride is way shorter, you're not going to be able to keep up. You would have to have a faster pace uh, than everyone else where you're overstriding, and that can cause um, a lot of injuries and a lot of stress on the pelvis. Uh, knee pain is typically seen when you start doing too much too soon. 
It is extremely important to slowly progress and build yourself up to the distances and not just jump into the end goal. Uh, so if you're starting to get a lot of knee pain um, and maybe you've only been doing it for, you know, maybe a couple weeks, a month, uh, and you're noticing all this knee pain, I would definitely suggest taking a look at your program. See if maybe you're progressing too quickly. Um, you shouldn't be progressing more than 10% every week. Uh, whether that's 10% of weight or 10% of distance, don't increase both at the same time. Do not do too much too soon because you'll end up getting injured and it'll take you way longer to get back to where you were or depending on the injury, you may never get to where you could have been. So please, please take your time. Don't rush into it. You know, you should be, you know, if you plan on doing the Iron Warrior event next year, you know, you can slowly start training now. It's never too early to start training. Okay. Um, the last one that I wanted to touch on is palsy. It, it's uh, numbness, paralysis, cramping, and pain in the shoulder girdle. And it is caused by the compression of nerves due to the rock. So you want to be sure you're using your hip belt as it takes off 30% of the load from the shoulders and reduces back strain. So your gear should be fitted properly to reduce friction. So like I said before, it helps prevent, you know, chafing and blisters. And it helps to take the weight off the shoulders when the hip straps are sitting in the right place. So when having the ruck placed on your back, a lower placement will create more of a body lean, which you want to avoid. A higher placement will cause destabilization of the spine. Uh, making it very hard to protect your back. So you want to avoid that as well. So a mid to low back placement is preferable, especially on uneven terrain. Um, so make sure that your, your, your bag is your proper fit. I know there's different sizes depending on, you know, the length of your torso. You want to make sure that those hip straps really are sitting right on the hips. Um, it will significantly help with your posture during your rock. Um, like I said before, you see those people where their, you know, their torsos are pretty much parallel to the floor. You don't want it to be bent over like that. You know, if you picture their spine, you know, see what position they're in. They're bent in half with all this weight just sitting on their back. It's just going to cause injuries. It's horrible to even think about. Um, so, you know, my main takeaways today, okay, make sure your gear is fitted properly for you. Before you even start to train, you should make sure that your ruck is fitting you properly. You know, you've packed it correctly so you've got the weight sitting in the right spot. You know, get some co-workers to help you with this. Um, someone that's got some experience with packing rucks and making sure that it's in the right place. You know, make sure you've got good boots that are going to be fitting your feet properly, that they aren't going to cause, you know, any blisters. Um, make sure you get that chafing cream so you can protect your skin. Okay, listen to your body, you know, if you start to feel your shins, if you've got shin splints, you'll know it, you know, if your shins start to get sore, your knees are hurting, make sure in the training program that you decide to follow that you are scheduling in deload weeks or recovery time, especially if you're, you know, starting now for a, you know, event a year from now, you've got plenty of time to work in some recovery uh, weeks into that training program. Okay. Do not progress too quick, okay? Another big takeaway is that it doesn't all need to be rucking. It shouldn't all be rucking. Make sure that you are getting into the weight room, you know, you're targeting your lower body, so you're doing squats, you're doing deadlifts, uh, you know, you're doing shoulder presses, so you're working on your shoulder strength, uh, you're doing, you know, farmer's carries, uh, working on that posture while carrying heavy loads, and they're all really important. Um, just if you need help uh, with programming, go talk to your PSP rep. They'll get you sorted out. Um, they'll help you work out a program that works best for you. Um, but don't wait till you know a month out to start training for these events. It takes time, especially the low bearing marches, because it's such a distance that you're working up to. Um, so yeah. Hopefully you take something away from this today. Um, if you've got a chain of command that 
you know, they're all just, we're going wrecking Monday, we're going wrecking Friday, we're running Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, please, please direct them to this. And hopefully um, they'll take away the information and implement it into, you know, your troop PT and so on. Okay, well, good luck with your training and have a good day.